Well, what a great, great day. What a great song that was, Breakthrough. You know, we've been um, thinking about how long we've been doing this sunrise service. 30 years, 1989 was our first Easter sunrise service. Actually, we had a sunrise service years before that. I think when I first moved here around 1983, it was um, not even sunrise. It was 10 o'clock on Easter morning, and I swore I'd never do it again because it was snowing with wind at 10 in the morning on Easter. I thought, forget it. You can't have Easter sunrise here in New Mexico. But here we are. I'm glad you came. Well, if you could see any of the video today or the videos from past weeks, we've been doing this little motorcycle thing you've noticed in different places, right? So I wanted to tell you about this motorcycle that's been in the videos. It's a 1974 blood red Norton Commando. It's an 850 Norton Commando. Now, it didn't look like that when I got it, we're gonna show you a before and after picture. Before, it was kind of beat up, it was bruised, it was scarred, but you know, there's something about restoring a vintage vehicle that just makes it better than the new model. When you compare something old and then you restore it and you bring it up, it's just, it's stunning. Here's an example. Let's say you're at a stoplight and you're driving your Chevy Bolt or Cruze, or Chevy Blazer, or Camaro, or your brand new Silverado truck. All of those are cool cars. All of those are good Chevy products. But you're at the stoplight, and a 1957 Bel Air Chevy convertible pulls up. Am I right? White walls. That beautiful blue color, that harbor blue paint. You love that. That's like way cooler than your Bolt. <laughs> you know, we love to see something that is old and almost discarded brought back to life. We have a whole new respect for the uh, devotion and patience and craftsmanship of the builder. Well, God does that. God loves to restore people. He takes them just as they are, and he turns them into a classic. Instead of making perfect people, I suppose God could make perfect people and take them immediately with him to heaven without a ding, without a scratch, but he doesn't do that. God takes broken ones, beat up ones, scarred by sin, damaged by time, wrong choices that they've made, weathered and scratched, and he does a full restoration job on their life. That's what God does. He turns old things into classics. How does he do that? He does that by a word, restoration, that is based on redemption. It is restoration that is based on redemption, and redemption is tied to resurrection. We've been doing a series, we've called it Bloodline. If you've been a part of our fellowship, you know about it. If not, doesn't matter. But we've been following, tracing from Genesis to Revelation, in part, the bloodline, the predictions of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. We followed it from Eden and now into eternity. Today, I want to take you to heaven, so to speak. We're going to read a text where we see people and angels singing about redemption and restoration because the risen Christ takes control. We're going to be looking at a message from the book of Revelation, the last book in the New Testament. It was written by a guy named John the Apostle. He was on an island known as Patmos, 25 miles off of the coast of Asia Minor. It was a prison colony. They would pe keep people there to isolate them as sort of a, a confinement, a prison. Now, when John wrote this book of Revelation, he was in his mid-90s. He was nearing 100 years of age. And now he's a prisoner. Now he's all alone. 
But God gives him this book of Revelation, which is a prophecy of the future. He sees the end of the ages, and he gets a peek into heaven itself. Now, if you've ever read the book of Revelation, you know there's, there's lots of symbols in it. There's lampstands and trumpets and bowls and beasts and creatures. And even here, we have a metaphor of a lamb and a lion. A lamb and a lion. Now, John had one time been a fisherman in a little lake in northern Israel called Galilee. And John was part of the inner circle with Jesus. You'd always see Peter, James, and John. They'd be hanging out together. And they'd be hanging out really close with Jesus. So he had a close, intimate, personal relationship with Jesus on the earth. And John, who wrote this book, was called the disciple whom Jesus loved. FYI, John wrote that. The disciple whom Jesus loved, he's writing about himself. I've always liked that. I am the disciple Jesus loved. You know what? You can write that. You're the disciple Jesus loved. Personally, all of you, in a close and intimate way. But now John is at the end of his life. He is isolated. He has no other believers around him. And in that lonely, isolated place, God gives him a vision, a revelation. And I just want to say something before we continue. You may be right now feeling isolated and alone, separated from people, even depressed. It's Easter, it's sunny, but you're feeling a cloud of depression. According to the Center of Disease Control, 9% of Americans have feelings of absolute hopelessness, despondency, and guilt that generate what they call a diagnosis of depression. Well, I want you to know something. We are praying for, like the song says, your breakthrough. You might be on the verge of the greatest victory of your life sitting here this morning as God reveals himself to you like he did to John. So we're in the book of Revelation in chapter 1, and I'm going to just read to you a passage out of Revelation 1 and then Revelation chapter 5, but we're going to begin with the scene. It's 95 A.D. It has been 60 years since John had seen or heard Jesus while he was on the earth. And the scene opens up in Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. It was the Lord's day, and I was worshiping in the Spirit. Suddenly I heard a loud voice behind me, a voice that sounded like a trumpet blast. But when I turned to see who was speaking to me, I saw seven gold lampstands. And standing in the middle of the lampstands was the Son of Man. He was wearing a long robe with a gold sash across his chest. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were bright like flames of fire. His feet were as bright as bronze refined in a furnace, and his voice thundered like mighty ocean waves. He had seven stars in his right hand, and a sharp two-edged sword came from his mouth. And his face was as bright as the sun in all of its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, and he said, Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one who died. Look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and the grave. John hung out with Jesus for three and a half years on this earth. John knew Jesus' tone of voice. John remembered the body language and, and just how Jesus expressed himself. John knew how Jesus walked, the gait of his walk, maybe even that unique laugh that Jesus had. It was all very familiar to him. And he had missed it for so long. But then one day, 
out of nowhere, it seems, on this island of Patmos, he hears a voice speaking to him. And he turns and he looks and it's someone. It's, it's Jesus. But this Jesus is very different from the Jesus he remembered on the shores of Galilee. This is not the Jesus from the children's poem, Gentle Jesus, Meek and Mild. This is like a whole new revised Jesus. This is giant Jesus, mighty and riled. He's in charge. This is not the vision of a crucified Christ. This is the vision of a glorified Christ, a dignified Christ, a magnified Christ. This was the resurrected Jesus. Not as a lamb, but as it were, a lion roaring with a loud voice. But then the visions continue. And when we get over a few chapters in chapter 5, John is now transported up into heaven. In Revelation 5, it says, And I saw a scroll in the right hand of the one who was sitting on the throne. There was writing on the inside and the outside of the scroll, and it was sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel who shouted with a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals on this scroll and unroll it? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll and read it. Then I wept because no one could be found who was worthy to open the scroll and read it. So now John has a vision where he is caught up into heaven and everybody in that heavenly scene, there's God on his throne, there are angels, there are elders, there are people, but they're all focused on this document, this book, this scroll. What is this scroll that everybody's looking at and talking about? Well, because this scroll involves the future and the fate of planet Earth, and because praise erupts when the only one qualified to open it up comes forward, we can surmise that this is nothing less than the title deed to planet Earth. The title deed to Earth itself. Earth belonged to God by creation. Earth was given to mankind as a stewardship, but Earth was forfeited to Satan in the Garden of Eden by Adam. Adam was like the Benedict Arnold of the universe. By his sin, he handed over control to the devil. That's why in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians 4, the devil is called the God of this world. The God of this world. And Paul said, all of creation now groans, wanting to be delivered from the bondage that we are in. Now, according to ancient Judaism, the customs and the laws of the Jews, the sign of a forfeited inheritance was a sealed scroll. Now, this baby was sealed seven times, meaning there are encumbrances on this deed. There are liens against this property. So a search is made for a liberator. A search is made for somebody who can take that document and break it open. And a search is made in the heavens and on the earth and in the netherworld. And the question is this, who is worthy? Who is worthy to break the seals on the scroll and unroll it? In other words, who has the divine right, the authority, the power to rule planet Earth? Now, I know many have been willing to do that. They've tried to do that. Alexander the Great tried to do that. All the different Caesars would have loved to rule the entire world. Some of them thought they actually did. Adolf Hitler would love to control the world at one time. But that's not the question. The question isn't who wants it. The question is who's worthy? Who's worthy? And when that question is asked, the only response is silence. Nobody in heaven, earth, or under the earth has an answer. It says in verse 3, but no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll and read it. No one. Literally, that means not even one. 
Think of it among all the angels, archangels, people, devils, politicians. Some get those two groups confused sometimes. <laughs> There's no answer. There's no person. Not among the angels, not among the archangels, not Abraham, not Isaac, not Jacob, not Joseph, not Moses, not David, not Solomon, not Isaiah, not Jeremiah, not Elijah, not Daniel, not Peter, not Paul. All of them were in heaven. No one gives an answer. And so John says when, when, when there was no answer and no one stepped forward, the only thing left to do was to weep. So he said, I wept much or I sobbed in abundance. It means strong, unrestrained emotion. Why is he crying like this? Because he is gripped now with the sense of utter hopelessness that without a liberator to remove the curse on the earth, we are doomed forever. That's the scene. After the scene comes the Savior. He steps in, verse 5. But one of the 24 elders said to me, stop weeping. A very sensitive angel, this one. Stop your crying. And he said this, look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the heir to David's throne, has conquered. He is worthy to open the scroll and break the seven seals. And I looked, and I saw a lamb that had been killed, but was now standing between the throne and the four living beings and among the 24 elders. He stepped forward. He took the scroll from the right hand of the one sitting on the throne. Now we know who this is, right? We, we don't have to really guess. Most of us know who we're talking about. All of these are titles for the Lord Jesus Christ. Here he's called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Those of you who know your Bibles know that that's a phrase that comes from the very first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 49, one of the tribes of Israel, the tribe of Judah. It was predicted that the ruler from Judah would rule the world, the tribe that is identified as the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's also called the heir to David's throne. You know that God promised David would have offspring that would one day rule the entire world, a picture and a prophecy of Jesus Christ. Now, John was Jewish. John knew this. John knew his Bible. He knew the books of Genesis and 2 Samuel. And so when the angel said, look, there's the lion of the tribe of Judah, John expected to turn around and see what he saw in that first chapter, this glorified lion-like figure of Jesus Christ. He expected to see Jesus, the Lion of Judah. You know, if I'm driving down the street with my grandkids and I say, look, a train, they, they, they expect to look out the window and not see a bunny rabbit. I know they would prefer to see a bunny rabbit than a train, but if I said, look, a train, they would expect to see a train and not a bunny rabbit. So the angel says, look, the lion of the tribe of Judah. John turned around and he expected to see what? A lion. A lion. But he says, I looked and I saw a lamb. A lamb? I thought you said, look, the lion. And I looked and I saw a lamb. A lamb? What, what, what can a lamb do? Lambs don't rule. Lambs, lambs, nobody's scared of a lamb. You've never seen a sign that people hang up, beware of lamb. <laughs> like a watchdog. You know, the movie wasn't Lambo. It was Rambo. Look, a lamb. Not only that, the word for lamb refers to a pet lamb. Only two times in the New Testament this word shows up. And it's a very tender little baby pet lamb, a beautiful, sweet little thing that you would cuddle. 
Some of you know, and John certainly knew, that every Passover, every family, every Jewish family took a lamb that was a year old or younger. It had to be beautiful. It had to be spotless. It had to be perfect. No flaws at all in it. And they would take that little baby lamb home for four days. It would become a part of the family. It would be like a little pet to the children. And then on the day of Passover, its throat would be slit and it would bleed out as a sacrifice for that family. That's the lamb that is referred to here. So he says, look, a lamb. And it's not just a lamb that's a pet lamb. It's a lamb that had been killed the text says. In other words, John looked and he saw a lamb that showed signs of violence and suffering. You know what this means? This means that when we get to heaven, we may well still see Jesus Christ with the scars on his hands, on his feet, and on his side, with the very marks of crucifixion that he died with. We might see them for all of eternity. You say, why on earth would, would we see that? Why on earth would he want to have that display? That's going to be his badge of honor. His badge of honor, because with those scars, he was able to save you and bring you to heaven. And to him, that's a badge of honor. There's a song written a few years ago by Mercy Me. Do you remember this song? The nails in your hands, the nail in your feet, they tell me how much you love me. The thorns on your brow, they tell me how you bore so much shame to love me. And when the heavens pass away, all your scars will still remain and forever they will say how much you love me. You're going to see those scars. You're going to look on the nail-scarred hands of Jesus one day and he's going to have a smile on his face not a frown on his brow as he welcomes you into his home. And it says the lamb was standing. That's odd. He looks to see a lion and he sees a lamb. He sees a lamb showing the marks of a violent death, and yet this lamb is not slumped over. It's not lying down. It's not recumbent that you would expect a lamb that went through that kind of an ordeal to look like. But he's standing up. He's alive. He's ready for action. He has the scars of his deadly wounds, but this is a resurrected lamb. He has the meekness of a lamb, you might say, but the strength, majesty, and readiness of a lion. In fact, it is those very wounds that qualify him to be the liberator, the restorer of the world. Listen carefully. Because he first came as the lamb, he can now come again as the lion. He rescued the world as a lamb so that he can rule the world as a lion. The lion is the lamb. One and the same. Look, a lion. That's a lamb. They're the same person. One is the first coming. The other is the second coming. So, the lamb steps up to take the scroll. Let's see what happens. A song happens. In verse 8, And as he took the scroll, the four living beings and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp, and they had gold bowls filled with incense, the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song with these words, You are worthy to take the scroll, to break its seals, and to open it, for you were killed and your blood has ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have caused them to become God's kingdom and his priests, and they will reign on the earth. Now, everything John has been describing so far in this vision has been building up to this moment. What moment? When the lamb steps forward and takes the scroll. When he takes the scroll, that is the greatest act in history. It's the greatest act in the book of Revelation. It's the greatest action in the story of mankind. 
He takes the title deed, the lost inheritance, and he is about to bring real, lasting, permanent change to the earth. That's what the rest of the book of Revelation is about. In the future, when Jesus comes back, you don't, people aren't going to vote him into office. He's just going to say, move over, I'm taking over. He comes as a lion. When he does that, when he takes the scroll out of the hand of the Father, at that moment, all of the prayers of all of God's people for all of the centuries will be answered. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It will be the remedy to all the tears like John's that were shed throughout all of time. So he takes the scroll, and as soon as he takes it, when the Lamb takes the scroll, the title deed, it says, and they sang a new song. Now stop on that for a moment. And they sang. Did you know they're singing in heaven? You say, oh yeah, I know that. I'm going to be sitting around, you might be thinking, listening to the angels sing. No, you're the choir. You're going to be singing in heaven. You're not going to be watching others sing. You're going to be singing. I believe every Christian should be a singer. You know why? You have something to sing about. That's why. There's a lot of other people that sing their songs. They really don't have what you have. You have something to sing about. And singing to God and worshiping God, that's one activity that you do in heaven that you do on earth as well. One, one activity you do here that you're going to do there. There are things that you won't do in heaven. You'll never evangelize another human being in heaven. You'll never pass out a tract. You'll never invite a person to Easter sunrise service. You'll never invite a person to freedom celebration. You're never going to pray for other people like you do here. You're not going to be feeding the poor in heaven. You're not going to be discipling others in heaven. But you will be singing. You will be worshiping. So I'm just telling you, why don't you just get into practice now? Why don't you get your voice tuned up for heaven? I even read an article that said, those who sing stay younger looking. I just had a lot of you perk up. <laughs> you got my attention, preacher. What was that about younger looking? Singers stay younger looking. You know why? They develop their cheek muscles so well that they don't wrinkle, the article said, as, long, as much as people who don't sing. Now let me just say this too. When you sing, sing like you mean it. Sing like you're singing about the Savior. Put your hearts into it. Put feeling into it. Put emotions into it. I know people are wired differently. Some are emotional. Some are stoic. I know we can never judge a person by how they're singing. But I've noticed a lot of people use excuses like, well, I'm not the emotional type. Or, I'm just not as expressive as my wife or my son or my husband. Well, it's funny because on the golf course, when you hit that great drive, it's funny how emotional you'll get. Or ladies, you might try on that dress and you get it from your husband and you get all emotional over that dress. Or when you see a puppy, you get all emotional when you see that puppy. I've been to sporting events like in this stadium here. And somebody makes a touchdown and you don't see too many fans with their arms crossed. Going, yeah, cool. You see them get excited, they get emotional. Or at concerts, when a song that is familiar is sung by the band and everybody starts singing. I've noticed that some pagans really know how to get excited. Why not some Christians? Why do some Christians think that enthusiasm for the most worthy one in the universe must somehow be carefully contained? There's a church in England that has a churchyard in it, a cemetery on the outside of it. And in that churchyard is a monument to a cat. A cat. You say, well, what's all that about? It seems that years ago, a cat used to wander into the worship services in church. And the community said that cat spends more time in church than anybody else in this community. So they gave it a monument. 
to the worshiping cat. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be outdone by a stupid cat. God is not excited about secret admirers. So let's get vocal. Let's, like them, sing a song. Now notice the song that they sang. What were they singing about? They were singing about God's supreme worth and Jesus' sacrificial death. His supreme worth and sacrificial death. Verse 9, they sang a new song with these words. You are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals and open it. For you were killed and your blood has ransomed people to God from every tribe, language, people, and nation. In other words, you are worthy to rule the world as a lion because you died for the world as the lamb. Let me say this. If you want to sing anointed songs, make sure those songs are filled with the Lord Jesus Christ and his blood. Don't be afraid to sing about the blood of Jesus Christ. Many churches are trying to take blood out and take the cross out. But the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. He rose from the dead, but first he died. He died. And then three days later, he conquered death for us. Did you know the Bible mentions blood 424 times? You go, yuck! Why so much? Why does the Bible make such a big deal out of it? Simply this, mankind has a huge major problem. If you want to hang out with God, there's one huge problem. It's called sin. That has to be taken away. That has to be forgiven. Sin is the great divider. Either you pay for your sin or somebody else pays for your sin. You know, the word gospel means good news, and our good news is that Jesus did what you cannot do. He died in your place and took your death sentence and then rose from the dead to justify anybody who believes in him. In fact, you could sum up the message of the whole Bible in one sentence given by John the Baptist. One sentence sums up the whole Bible. Behold the Lamb. Behold the Lamb. It's all about Jesus. The Old Testament asked the question we found in Genesis 22. Where is the Lamb? Remember Isaac asked his dad that when they went up to Mount Moriah to sacrifice? Hey, Dad, um, here's the wood and the fire, but where is the lamb? The New Testament answers that question. Behold the lamb. That was John the Baptist at the Jordan River. So the Old Testament asked the question, where is the lamb? The New Testament answers the question, behold the lamb, and in heaven we will sing, worthy is the lamb. Worthy is the lamb. Revelation 5. There was a little boy who was told by the doctor that he could save his sister's life. It seems that she was dying. All the little boy had to do was give his sister some of his blood. His sister was six years old. And she, as I said, was nearing death. She had a disease from which that boy recovered two years earlier. Her only chance for survival was to get a blood transfusion from somebody who once had the disease but conquered the disease. And since both brother and sister had the same rare blood type, he was the ideal donor. So the doctor bent down and asked the little boy, Johnny, would you give your blood for your sister Mary? And little Johnny hesitated for a moment. His lips started quivering, trembling. And he said, sure. He said, I'll give my blood for my sister. So they were both wheeled into the operating room. Mary was very pale and very thin. 
Johnny was very robust and strong. Neither of them spoke, but their eyes locked, and he smiled at her just a bit. And as blood was siphoned into Mary's veins, she started to peek up and perk up. You could see new life coming into her body. And when it was almost over, little Johnny looked up at the doctor and he said, Doc, when do I die? It was only then that the doctor realized why Johnny hesitated and why his lip had trembled. Because he actually thought that in giving his blood for his sister, he was going to be giving up his life. And that brave little boy, in that brief moment, made a great decision. I'm willing to die for my sister. He didn't. He misunderstood it. He just had to give her some blood, and they both lived. But Jesus made a great decision for you. He said, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down. I have the power to take it up again. Jesus laid it down. We celebrated that on Good Friday. Jesus took it up again. That's what we're celebrating today. Newness of life. But Jesus made the decision to go to the cross for you. What I'm wondering about is your decision. You must make your decision. If you have not had a divine blood transfusion yet, I'm suggesting now is the perfect time. It's Easter Sunday. It didn't get any better. It's never a better setup than this. Look, you're right here. You made the decision to get up and come to this service. And we're glad you did. Some of you have been believers for a long time. Some of you for a shorter time. Some of you not at all. Some of you might be very religious, but you've never made a conscious decision to follow Jesus Christ. You've never personalized it. You've never said, there was a time when I decided to turn my life over to Jesus Christ and have him rule and reign every decision that I make until that Easter morning at that stadium. And I have so many people over the years that tell me that very thing. It was on Easter Sunday that year that I came forward. So I'm going to give you that opportunity after we pray. Let's do that. Let's pray together. Father, how thankful we are that the Lion of the tribe of Judah, seen also as a slain bloodied lamb, one who suffered great violence at the cross. He's the only one worthy to take that book, that scroll, that document, that title, deed of the earth, and rule and reign. He's the only one that lived a perfect life. He's the only one that died a sacrificial death. He's the only one that has the authority and the right to rule. Until he comes again and rules the earth, which he will do, we want him to rule over our lives. We want him to take the title deed of our life. We want you to do a full restoration job on us. Restore us, redeem us, rescue us. I pray for those who are here seated in different places, brought by a variety of friends and family members, or they've come on their own, but they're feeling isolated. They're feeling alone. They've come to a place where they wonder, is there something more to life than I've already experienced? Because what I've experienced doesn't satisfy. Confirm to them, Lord, right now, yes, there is. Yes, there is hope. Yes, there is joy. Yes, there is peace waiting for them in the salvation that comes only through Jesus Christ. Bring that confirmation. Seal that in hearts around this stadium right now. And those that are tuning in by radio or watching over the internet in various places. Bring new life. Bring resurrected life. Bring life change, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, we're not done yet. The best is yet to come. Now comes the moment of choice, your choice. I'm gonna ask you if you've never given your life to Christ. I'm not asking you, have you ever believed in Christ? I'm asking you, have you ever surrendered your life to Jesus? Have you ever given him your life? Do you know that there's a conscious decision point that you have made to turn your life to him, to follow him, to be his disciple? Maybe some of you are thinking back to a time in high school or junior high or before that where you went to a camp, you threw a pine cone in the fire, they sang a song, you felt good for a week or two or a month, you went to church, but then you dropped off. But here's the deal. You're not today consciously following Jesus. You're not living a life of obedience to him. I'm gonna ask you to change all that. Either come back home to him or come to him for the first time, no matter who you are. I'm gonna ask you to get up from where you are and come down on the field like some of our helpers and counselors are doing right now. Just get up as we sing this song. Um, your friends will wait. Your car will stay in its place. Nobody stole it. But you get up and come. And the rest of you pray for those who are making this decision. Get up and find the nearest set of steps. Just come down on this field. It won't take but a few moments. But you come and make your choice to follow Jesus, to have new life. You're turning over the pink slip of your life to him. The ownership of your life to him. so much shame to love me and when the heavens pass away all your scars will still remain and forever they will say how much you love me you're thinking okay I, I don't quite understand this why are you doing this Jesus often called people publicly so that there would be a point in their lives where they knew that was the time I made a decision to follow Christ again the issue isn't do you go to church or do you believe in God are you a follower of Jesus Christ if you're not quite sure be sure you get up and you come Come and join the friends who have gathered down here. We'd love to say a prayer with you. It'll just take a moment.
top even. We're going to wait for you to come. I know that some people are trying to get out early, but let me just plead and say, please pray for those who are coming, making this decision. Billy Graham used to say at all of his crusades, the buses will wait. Well, breakfast will wait. The donuts will wait. The coffee will wait. This is a very, very, very important decision that so many are making. We're glad, we're glad you're coming. We're going to wait a few more moments for you. close this off and pray for those who have come forward. Just ask yourself this, if you're hesitating. Ever wanted a do-over? Ever wanted a second chance? Easter's all about second chances. It's all about pressing the do-over button. God will give you a brand new life, a brand new slate to wash and wipe away all of your past and make you a new creation, the Bible says. Anyone in Christ is a new creation. so glad that you not only came to Easter sunrise, but you came forward to say a prayer. So um, this is the brand new start of a brand new life for you, a very different life. Just like the little illustration, God doesn't make perfect people and take them to heaven. He likes classics. He likes to restore people. I'm looking at a whole bunch of classics he's about to restore. Bring you back to your original purpose for which you were created. You were created to know God. You were created to fellowship with God. You were created to walk in communion and fellowship and enjoy His peace on a daily basis. So I'm going to lead you in a prayer. A prayer is simply talking to God. That's all it is. So I'm going to ask you to say these words out loud after me, okay? From your heart. Repeat these after me, but but just say them to the Lord as you give your life to Him. Say, Lord, I give you my life. I know that I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. I believe in Jesus. I believe He came from heaven to earth. I believe He died on a cross, that He shed His blood for me, and that He rose again from the dead and that he's alive right now. I turn from my sin. I repent of it. I turn to Jesus Christ as my Savior and as my Lord. Help me to live for him. In Jesus' name I pray. 
Amen. Yeah. We hope you enjoyed this message from Skip Heitzig of Calvary Church. How will you put the truths that you learned into action in your life? Let us know. Email us at mystory@calvarynm.church. At and just a reminder, you can support this ministry with a financial gift at calvarynm.church/give. Thank you for joining us for this teaching from Calvary Church.